My first inkling that it existed was from someone linking me to a Craigslist ad. A Craigslist ad is not the way I like to find out about new items being available or something on the verge of disappearing. I prefer private emails, being told about something going on and intervening there. But Craigslist it was, and it turned out that a very large audio collection was on the verge of disappearing, and somebody had to do something. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Peter Healy, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. I'll talk more about the actual item that became available, but I also wanted to cover the nature of large-scale preservation projects, cases where things were on the verge of disappearing or being thrown out or falling into the hands of a group that'll break it apart and, quote-unquote, saving it. The narrative is very clear. Something isn't going to be there, and if we give money, time, and effort, it'll stick around. That's a very alluring story. And I think it sometimes gets overused when people find out about a large selection of items and think it's all unique. It's not going to be anywhere else. We'll never get that choice again. In point of fact, a lot of things exist in many forms out there. That record that you think isn't going to be seen again has hundreds of little friends. Videotapes that are copies of shows you can get on DVD. Maybe even large amounts of computer equipment that seem rare, but they made millions of them, and there's plenty more to go. That changes for me when a collection includes not just the obvious commercial items, but what feel like homemade, one-of-a-kind, or in-process documentation that we otherwise wouldn't be privileged enough to see. So there we come to this Craigslist ad. It touted the mass of items that were available, the huge amount of tapes that were taken from this person's estate, especially involving, so it claimed, his work at Atlantic Records. These were videotapes, reel-to-reel, quarter-inch tape, and a whole other range of magnetic media that even the seller claimed he hadn't gone through. The asking price was $8,000, a sum which... Some think is a deal-breaker, but in certain situations, you can get the money, and even the Internet Archive has been known to spend money here and there if it turns out the collection is unique enough. It wasn't clear we'd want to put money into it. But another person, named Bobby, was entranced by it and began raising money on GoFundMe to see if he could reach the $8,000. I was more than happy to put my name and hype behind it. Bobby seemed like a pretty good guy. And so, within about 24 hours, the $8,000 were raised, and the seller was offered the money, which they accepted. Within a short time, we had planned for a pickup, how the money would be handled, and the rental of a van, plus another hundred details, that usually pop up. We drove out there on a weekend, a trip of a few hundred miles. We did the transaction, got all the items out of the storage unit, put them into the van until the van could barely hold another thing, filled up a second car, and then made the drive back to a storage unit that I had put aside for this project. Over the course of a few hours, we repackaged most of the tapes and put them into new boxes that we had bought, since many of these old boxes were weathered, broken, and didn't have any actual identifying information on the outside. This left us with about 50 to 60 boxes stacked up in a storage unit, and we called it a day. Since then, we've had a couple sessions of cataloging what's in this collection, trying to understand who the person was who had it, 
what they like to collect and what quote unquote value these magnetic items have. Here's what we know so far. The person who owned this was named Mark Pines. He was a musician, an electrician, a producer, a writer, an editor, and somebody who loved music from every side of the production, either as a performer or the person who just wired the speakers in your house for better sound. He worked at live recording, professional organizations, and video editing. He had died in 2020, and this whole lot of material was as a result of the estate sale. There were no personal papers, there were no documents or photographs of the time he spent, of the people he knew, of what he had been involved in. This particular lot was nothing but work product, his own or people he had collaborated with. They were videotapes indicating they were part of a commercial being shot, or live performances with the date on them and nothing else. In some cases, we could tell this was something pretty special. Very large reel-to-reels, obviously meant for recording equipment, that were marked master tapes. Metal trunks from a Jamaican music festival in the 1980s, with markings on the outside indicating which bands were being recorded, whether they were filming people at the airport, and if they were interviews from various musicians and organizers about this event. Famous names are everywhere in this. Hall and Oates, Huey Lewis and the News, The Grateful Dead, The B-52s, but also a lot of bands we have no idea about, that until we digitize and look at the images on these videotapes, we're going to have no idea what the story is. So that takes us to where we are now. Volunteers have been going through this collection, taking photos, and then placing them into albums so we can transcribe what we see on the outside. This will help us make decisions about priority, which formats we have to track down and see how easy it is to transfer off of them, and also to have an idea of what constitutes completion. Hundreds of people gave money, $5, $10, and in a few cases, thousands of dollars. I think it's very important that communication be key with these investors. Bobby made a promise, and I made a promise, to digitize as much as possible and to make it available as widely as possible. And to do that, we have to travel through a very rocky landscape indeed. The digitization of magnetic media is starting to fade away as an art. There are tapes who are starting to shed and lose their magnetic coating. There are also a lot of dying videotape machines of various formats we don't think about anymore. Formats like Umatic and Betacam SP, which many of these tapes happen to be in. Umatic and Betacam are very popular with professional organizations in the 1970s and 1980s. They are a large advantage over 16mm film, which is what many news organizations were using before then. So there's a lot of product that you can buy to shoot in those formats. But those machines haven't been manufactured in a very long time. They need maintenance, and they need people to take care of them. As we wander in with anywhere from a half thousand to a thousand videotapes, it's going to be a matter of prioritization and trying to get our hands on equipment and expertise to bring it all together. This isn't the only collection of magnetic tape that I'm dealing with, so it's a really good test to see how fast it can be done and how effectively. Some time ago, trying to figure out all the parameters of magnetic tape digitization, I assembled people on a Jason Scott Discord and asked them everything I could about the process. What I know is that there's not a lot of people who enjoy doing more than a few tapes every once in a while. Only a vanishingly small handful of folks will want to do more than 50 or 100 of them before they find anything else in the world that they'd rather do. But when you run into the inevitable problems that will crop up, you can get through it pretty quickly and end up with some very 
rewarding results. That's what I'm looking forward to. And you know, the seller, as part of their prerogative, had split off some of the items in this collection and were selling them separately. Very clearly marked quarter-inch tapes of audio performances in clubs and so on. Names you would recognize. But believe it or not, that's not very important to me. I don't know if we need yet another live performance of a song that we all know because it was played incessantly on the radio in which we can buy the CD reissue of any time we want to. Now, what I'm interested in are times, places, people that are long past, art galleries that are gone, actors and actresses who only were in the business for a short period of time, maybe bands that couldn't survive past their first album and which have a small amount of performances under their belt before they split apart, go civilian, and are never heard from again. Those are the real treasures, and many of them are going to be in this collection. I'm very much looking forward to see what comes out the other end of this. It's going to be something unique, for sure. Mark Pines was a very, very eclectic man. He took interest in getting good shots, but also socializing and being a part of many different musicians' and performers' lives. It didn't take me long to find his Facebook page, to see the web of friends and neighbors that he left behind, and who all, to each individual, thought he was a bright spot, a person who loved music, who loved performing, and who loved capturing these moments as best as he could throughout his career. He had lived a full and wonderful life, and while he and I never met, I personally am looking forward to bringing Mark Pine's life to life once more. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Forrest Fuqua, Mark Pilgrim, Corey Thomas, Emilio Oliveira, Matt Reynolds, and Ernie Hershey, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. The Mark Pines Collection will be at the Internet Archive at some point in the coming months. I've purchased a video digitization rig, something I should have done a while ago, and this represents me moving into yet another medium that I'm digitizing right now. Maybe at some point it'll grow old, but for the moment I still adore taking something trapped in a medium that is very difficult to play and very hard to distribute, and providing it a new lease on life, a new chapter, and a chance, just a gamble, to live forever in other people's heads. <laughs>